The sun shone white in a hard, dark blue-violet sky. The air was clear and clean, without smoke or moisture. There was a vividness to things, a hardness of edge and corner, a clarity. Everything stood out separate, itself. I'm just a poor wayfaring stranger Traveling through Hi everyone, this is Ivy Tara Blair, and welcome to Ivy Tara Blair Unplugged 2021. I'm in a different situation here, I'm not in the studio. It was actually never my goal to record all of Unplugged in the studio. The goal was, you know, to be less formal, to not be in the studio. But I just never got around to setting up the mic outside the studio until I needed one for a different project. So, what happened to my unplugged podcast project? Well, it got interrupted by books. I put this and other stuff up on Twitter and, you know, pandemic and lots of Twitter conversations. And the next thing I knew, I was recording an anthology with Phil Brucato and then another book, Red Shoes, with Phil Brucato. Uh, and then another book, Not My Ruckus by Chad Music, published through Cinnabar Moth Publishing. And then another book, Gracie and Zeus Live the Dream, by Elizabeth Roderick, also through Cinnabar. And uh, Cinnabar Moth and I have teamed up. I'm, I'm on the staff, I guess you would say. This is what I have most wanted as an audiobook narrator, is to be a staff narrator, as it were. So I was thrilled, happy, excited, nervous. Not My Ruckus is a book that should be running around winning all kinds of awards, and I was extremely honored to narrate it. Gracie and Zeus Live the Dream is an absolutely hilarious romp. People would call it a rom-com, but there's not much rom, and there's a certain amount of com, and mostly it's about characters. It's really fun neurodivergent characters having a, an adventure that ranges from the absurd and the hilarious to the extremely serious and scary. I have been so lucky to have these books come my way. In the midst of all of this, there has been what I keep jokingly referring to as the secret project. There is indeed a secret project. And it is for this reason that I finally have a microphone that I can use outside the studio. It's a nice little mic. It's no, no great or bad thing. It's just a little mic that does what it does. But it does give me the ability to record from my bedroom. So any ambient sound you hear in here is actually because I've got a cat next to me and a dog who might walk in at any moment and birds tweeting outside. And I'm not in my studio, folks. It's not silent in here. I am going to read a little bit from Ursula Le Guin's The Dispossessed, which is, like so many of her books, a book that lives in the furniture of my mind. I don't remember from whom I first read that as a description, books that become part of the furniture of your mind. I would say The Dispossessed went way beyond furniture. It's, it's landscape. It is interior landscape for Ivy's brain. This is uh, about a quarter of the way into the book, and here is the description of what is termed a utopian society, but the the utopianists were several generations in, and they they weren't in it for the utopianism at this point. They were in it for a life that was just in a very different way, in a very pragmatic way. And our young protagonist has arrived in the capital city of his planet, Abine, on the planet Inares. It's a double planetary system. Inares is the moon, a very, very large moon, of the planet Uras. Decentralization had been an essential element in Odo's plans for the society she did not live to see founded. She had no intention of trying to de-urbanize civilization. 
though she suggested that the natural limit to the size of a community lay in its dependence on its own immediate region for essential food and power. She intended that all communities be connected by communication and transportation networks, so that goods and ideas would get where they were wanted, and the administration of things might work with speed and ease, and no community should be cut off from change and interchange. But the network was not to be run from the top down. There was to be no controlling center, no capital, no establishment for the self-perpetuating machinery of bureaucracy— and the dominance drive of individuals seeking to become captains, bosses, chiefs of state. Her plans, however, had been based on the generous ground of Uras. On Arid and Aris, the communities had to scatter widely in search of resources, and few of them could be self-supporting no matter how they cut back their notions of what is needed for support. They cut back very hard indeed, but to a minimum beneath which they would not go. They would not regress to pre-urban, pre-technological tribalism. They knew that their anarchism was the product of a very high civilization, of a complex, diversified culture, of a stable economy and a highly industrialized technology that could maintain high production and rapid transportation of goods. However vast the distances separating settlements, they held to the ideal of complex organism. They built the roads first, the houses second. The special resources and products of each region were interchanged continually with those of others in an intricate process of balance, that balance of diversity which is the characteristic of life, of natural and social ecology. But, as they said in the analogic mode, you can't have a nervous system without at least a ganglion and preferably a brain. There had to be a center. The computers that coordinated the administration of things, the division of labor and the distribution of goods, and the central federatives of most of the work syndicates were in Abene, right from the start. And from the start, the settlers were aware that unavoidable centralization was a lasting threat to be countered by lasting vigilance. O child anarchia, infinite promise, infinite carefulness, I listen, I listen in the night, by the cradle deep as the night. Is it well with a child? Pio Atian, who took the pravic name Tober, wrote that in the 14th year of the settlement. The Odonians' first efforts to make their new language, their new world, into poetry were stiff, ungainly, moving. Abene, the mind, in the center of Inaris, was there, now, ahead of the dirigible on the great green plain. That brilliant deep green of the fields was unmistakable a color not native to Inares. Only here and on the warm shores of the Karen Sea did the old world grains flourish. Elsewhere the staple grain crops were ground hollum and pale mean grass. When Shevek was nine, his afternoon schoolwork for several months had been caring for the ornamental plants in Wide Plains community, delicate exotics that had to be fed and sunned like babies. He had assisted an old man in the peaceful and exacting task, had liked him and liked the plants and the dirt and the work. When he saw the color of the plain of Abenay, he remembered the old man and the smell of fish oil, manure, and the color of the first leaf buds on small bare branches, that clear, vigorous green. He saw in the distance among the vivid fields a long smudge of white which broke into cubes like spilt salt as the dirigible came over. A cluster of dazzling flashes at the east edge of the city made him wink and see dark spots for a moment. The big parabolic mirrors that provided solar heat for Abenay's refineries. The dirigible came down at a cargo depot at the south end of town, and Shevek set off into the streets of the biggest city in the world. They were wide, clean streets. They were shadowless, for Abenay lay less than 30 degrees north of the equator, and all the buildings were low, except for the strong, spare towers of the wind turbines. The sun shone white in a hard, dark blue-violet sky. The air was clear and clean, without smoke or moisture. There was a vividness to things, a hardness of edge and corner, a clarity. Everything stood out separate, itself. The elements that made up Abenay were the same as in any other Odonian community, repeated many times. Workshops, factories, domiciles, dormitories, learning centers, meeting halls, distributories, depots, refectories. 
The bigger buildings were most often grouped around open squares, giving the city a basic cellular texture. It was one subcommunity or neighborhood after another. Heavy industry and food processing plants tended to cluster on the city's outskirts, and the cellular pattern was repeated in that related industries often stood side by side on a certain square or street. The first such that Chevec walked through was a series of squares, the textile district, full of hollow fiber, processing plants, spinning and weaving mills, dye factories, and cloth and clothing distributories. The center of each square was planted with a little forest of poles strung from top to bottom with banners and pennants of all the colors of the dyer's art, proudly proclaiming the local industry. Most of the city's buildings were pretty much alike, plain, soundly built of stone or cast foam stone. Some of them looked quite large to Chevec's eyes, but they were almost all of one story only because of the frequency of earthquake. For the same reason, the windows were small and of a tough silicon plastic that did not shatter. They were small, but there were a lot of them, for there was no artificial lighting provided from an hour before sunrise to an hour after sunset. No heat was furnished when the outside temperature went above 55 degrees Fahrenheit. It was not that Abinet was short of power, not with her wind turbines and the earth temperature differential generators used for heating, but the principle of organic economy was too essential to the functioning of the society not to affect ethics and aesthetics profoundly. Excess is excrement, Oda wrote in the analogy. Excrement retained in the body is a poison. Abinet was poisonless, a bare city, bright, the colors light and hard, the air pure. It was quiet. You could see it all laid out as plain as spilled salt. Nothing was hidden. The squares, the austere streets, the low buildings, the unwalled workyards were charged with vitality and activity. As Chevec walked, he was constantly aware of other people walking, working, talking, faces passing, voices calling, gossiping, singing, people alive, people doing things, people afoot. Workshops and factories fronted on squares or on their open yards, and their doors were open. He passed a glassworks, the workmen tipping up a great molten blob as casually as a cook serves soup. Next to it was a busy yard where foam stone was cast for construction. The gang foreman, a big woman in a smock white with dust, was supervising the pouring of the cast with a loud and splendid flow of language. After that came a small wire factory, a district laundry, a luthier's where musical instruments were made and repaired, the district's small goods distributory, a theater, a tile works. The activity going on in each place was fascinating, and mostly out in full view. Children were around, some involved in the work with the adults, some underfoot making mud pies, some busy with games in the street, one sitting perched up on the roof of the learning center with her nose deep in a book. The wire maker had decorated the shop front with patterns of vines worked in painted wire, cheerful and ornate. The blast of steam and conversation from the wide open doors of the laundry was overwhelming. No doors were locked, few shut. There were no disguises and no advertisements. It was all there, all the work, all the life of the city, open to the eye and to the hand. And every now and then, down Depot Street, a thing came careering by, clanging a bell, a vehicle crammed full of people and with people festooned on stanchions all over the outside, old women cursing heartily as it failed to slow down at their stop so they could scramble off, a little boy on a homemade tricycle pursuing it madly, electric sparks showering blue from the overhead wires at crossings. As if that quiet, intense vitality of the streets built up every now and then to discharge point and leapt the gap with a crash and a blue crackle and the smell of ozone. These were the Abinet omnibuses, and as they passed, one felt like cheering. Depot Street ended in a large, airy place where five other streets rayed into a triangular park of grass and trees. Most parks on Inares were playgrounds of dirt or sand, with a stand of shrub and tree hollows. This one was different. Chevec crossed the trafficless pavement and entered the park, drawn to it because he had seen it often in pictures, and because he wanted to see alien trees, Urazi trees, from close up to experience the greenness of those multitudinous leaves. 
The sun was setting, the sky was wide and clear, darkening to purple at the zenith, the dark of space showing through the thin atmosphere. He entered under the trees, alert, wary. Were they not wasteful, those crowding leaves? The tree hollum got along very efficiently with spines and needles and no excess of those. Wasn't all this extravagant foliage mere excess, excrement? Such trees couldn't thrive without a rich soil, constant watering, much care. He disapproved of their lavishness, their thriftlessness. He walked under them, among them. The alien grass was soft, underfoot. It was like walking on living flesh. He shied back onto the path. The dark limbs of the trees reached out over his head, holding their many wide green hands above him. Awe came into him. He knew himself blessed, though he had not asked for blessing. Some ways before him, down the darkening path, a person sat reading on a stone bench. Chevek went forward slowly. He came to the bench and stood looking at the figure who sat, with head bowed, over the book in the green-gold dusk under the trees. It was a woman of fifty or sixty, strangely dressed, her hair pulled back in a knot. Her left hand on her chin nearly hid the stern mouth, her right held the papers on her knee. They were heavy, those papers. The cold hand on them was heavy. The light was dying fast, but she never looked up. She went on reading the proof sheets of the social organism. Chevek looked at Odo for a while, then he sat down on the bench beside her. He had no concept of status at all, and there was plenty of room on the bench. He was moved by a pure impulse of companionship. He looked at the strong, sad profile, and at the hands, an old woman's hands. He looked up into the shadowy branches. For the first time in his life, he comprehended that Odo, whose face he had known since his infancy, whose ideas were central and abiding in his mind and the mind of everyone he knew, that Odo had never set foot on Inares, that she had lived and died and was buried in the shadow of green-leaved trees, in unimaginable cities, among people speaking unknown languages, on another world. Odo was an alien and exile. <laughs> In the background, you can probably hear my cat. She has decided that she can lay right next to me because I am distracted. She's not allowed this high up on the bed because I'm quite allergic to her. Everyone, meet Naomi the cat. Naomi, meet the podcast listeners. One of the things that always strikes me about Le Guin's prose, I've said it a zillion times and I will keep saying it forever and ever, she writes such spare poetic prose that you almost can't help but read it as poetry. And of course, she was a poet as well. But um, the other thing that's always hits me really hard every time I read her work, especially when I read it out loud, from the first moment I picked up that book of short stories, is how much space there is in everything she writes. And in this particular book, The Dispossessed, everything is very, very spare because the place is very, very spare. There's no excess. There's no excrement. There's no poison. Well, there is, but not in Chevek and not in the ideal of his society. The way that lends itself to the language. Ah, oh, I just love it. Uh, let's see here. He saw in the distance among the vivid fields a long smudge of white, which broke into cubes like spilt salt as the dirigible came over. I have literally never forgotten that phrase. From the moment I read it, I still remember reading it and just being stopped dead and going, oh my god, that was amazing. <laughs> It's not just that she is describing a bare, open, vivid place, right? She's using bare, open, vivid language at the same time. It was not that Abinay was short of power, not with her wind turbines and the earth temperature differential had generators used for heating, 
But the principle of organic economy was too essential to the functioning of the society not to affect ethics and aesthetics profoundly. So she then goes on to describe the open, sparse activity of the city being right out where everyone could see it, everyone being right out where everyone can see each other, the open courtyards as each group of buildings related to each other is built around a central area. It's She is describing a, sp- a sparse place in a sparse way until she gets to the people bits. The people, suddenly she gets very lavish with language, as lavish as Le Guin usually gets anyway. Next to it was a busy yard where foam stone was being cast for construction. The gang foreman, a big woman in a smock white with dust, was supervising the pouring of a cast with a loud and splendid flow of language. Ugh. Another phrase I have literally never forgotten since the first time I read it. Um, the wire maker had decorated the shop front with patterns of vines worked in painted wire, cheerful and ornate. The blast of steam and conversation from the wide-open doors of the laundry was overwhelming. So everywhere, all over Inaris, they're they're living on barely enough. They have, however, a richness of relationship and of mind that is the only surfeit they have in their culture, in their space, in their place. And when she describes those aspects of Inaris, her sparse language goes to definitive, declarative (laughs) beauty of description. And then, of course, Shevek's concept of the trees, which hold true right up until he sees the sunlight through the leaves, that they seem excessive, that they gobble too many resources, that aren't they... Aren't they uh, basically robbing, robbing of the the barely sufficient earth and giving back nothing? Oh, no, wait, what they are giving back is blessing. Later in the book, Shvek goes to Uras. As a physicist, he really, really, really needs to meet with others who have done the kind of study he has done at the level he has done it. And Daenerys has very well-educated populace, but he's a genius, and there's just statistical problems with the number of people there are on his planet. So he ends up going to Aras, one of the first people to go from Anaris to Aras since the original settlement many generations before. And while there, pretty early on, he experiences snow. And he has the same reaction to it, that it just seems like this overwhelmingly excessive uh, concept. But he had already learned much, much more uh, in his life about what generosity was. And certainly it sounds like the trees uh, near the square, near the park where Odo's statue sits, are an idea of natural excess and generosity given to him by the natural world. He'd had a lot of love given to him by the human world. Though when he reached the snow, he understood that to be a blessing, a joyfulness that was in no way excess, that no one could ever call excremental or poisonous in its lavish generosity. Oh... How I do love her prose. Thank you all so much for listening. And I hope to see you, hear you. I hope you to hear me. I hope that you enjoy listening to the next episode of Unplugged. And everybody, be good to each other. She said she'd meet me. Just go